is going to carry the lower bridge down here to the front. And we're looking at, this is a pretty good walk. A little over two miles. We'll be doing some talking here in the beginning. From here we're going to move down to the overlook of the bridge, sort of where we can move from. And then we're going to take a pretty good walk all the way down to the fords where our federal forces cross. And then we're going to make our way back up here and look at the up right about between 11 30 and 12. We'll have a pretty good break an hour and a half or so and then we're going to meet down here once again at the parking lot and then pick up the afternoon the final attack portion of the of the fight and starting at 1 30 we're going to make our way from these fields all the way out to the high point the ninth new york hawkins who have mine and so it's a pretty good walk this afternoon so i'd say the terrain this afternoon a little more this morning and this afternoon today uh, a little more difficult than what we saw yesterday. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so this morning we're going to start with the better defenses of the lower bridge. We're looking at a little more than 500 soldiers. Commanded by Robert Toombs. Toombs of, say, a political general. He's almost the president of the Confederacy. And after things weren't going well for him in, in Richmond, he decided he wanted to come out in the field. And so he did. And the claim for his defense of this south end of the field. So he has about 500 men. And as we look down here towards the bridge, you can barely see the bridge. But when we move down here, we usually don't get this view of the bridge. People usually get to the bridge, and you're just sort of focused on the bridge and everything in the south. We have to look at right down in front of you would have been the second Georgia regiment. To the left would have been the 20th Georgia. And the left of their line was pretty much right about here in front of us. 20th Georgia. And then the line stretched, there was a skirmish line stretching about 200 yards further upstream to the north. Really stretched out. And using this rock wall, you can see there's a fence over here. so. Rock wall, fences, down trees along this ridge, and even closer. What we have to try to remember is that this road wasn't here. So this has been sort of flattened out a little bit here to construct this road. So this hill just would have continued on. And so using this terrain, using trees, some Confederates even in the trees, we're looking at the Confederate line about 200 yards down to the left of 20th Georgia. Cummings was their commander. Holmes was the commander right here of the second. <laughs> there were roughly 20 to 30 Confederate soldiers. The rifle pits, which we're going to see here. There was some artillery behind you, a little bit to the north. There were two batteries. Richardson, Eshelman, they're back there. You can picture where the auto farm lane is. I know many of you folks have been here before, so the auto farm lane to the west of us and to get to the auto farm lane we sort of go up and over a ridge and then we get to the farm lane. Just on the back side of that ridge that's where those two batteries were posted so a picture around the area of the 11th Ohio Monument sort of on this side of the 11th Ohio Monument that's the monument that sits out in the field along the auto farm lane. So those two guns were there. Tombs figured out those two batteries wouldn't really do much good and so another battery was posted just to the south of us and we'll see that high ground too before we drop down and make our way towards Snavely's Ford. So I just wanted to start here this morning because you get a different look of the field. I have to try and remember also that these trees on the other side of the Antietam Creek would not have been here. So this was very good terrain. Often we get questions why the bridge, why the focus on the bridge. Wasn't it foolish for the Federals to try and carry the bridge? And we'll get into that a little bit later on. You're going to talk about that maybe. I'll talk about it a little bit here as well. But in the end, I think it's it's the only way the Federal soldiers can cross the creek. They're trying to bring across the Union 9th Corps, 12 to 13,000 men. They need the bridge. In the end, there's no way around it. Not only do they know that, but obviously the Confederates are here for day and a half or two days before the battle unfolds on this part of the field. They also know that the Union forces are going to need the bridge. Really, not many places up and down the Antietam Creek to cross the creek. 
to cross a large body of soldiers across the creek. There are fords up and down the Antietam, but they're not military fords, they're farmers' fords. Some of the problems the, the federal forces run into that engineers come down to scout out positions for a ford, but the Confederates are already on this side of the Antietam Creek, and so they start shooting at the engineers, and the engineers are like, I'm an engineer, I'm not an infantryman, I'm not getting paid to be shot at. So they, maybe they don't do a, a, a great job in scouting out positions where the fords are located. And we'll see some of the, I don't know, folly is a good word, but some of the follies that unfold in where fords were located, where they weren't located, and when soldiers get down there, they realize this isn't a good military ford. Military, a sort of a, a definition of a ford, you have to have a shallow entry and a shallow exit point. Way to move in, easy way to move out, in a solid rocky bottom. We're going to be hard pressed to find those features along the banks of the Antietam Creek, and we're going to see that as we walk along this morning. <laughs> Another, another thing real quick is if it was easy to cross the Antietam Creek, do you think the people back in 1836 would have built the beautiful three-arch stone bridge we're looking at? Probably not. And there's another beautiful three-arch stone bridge built less than a mile up the stream. And then less than a mile, another beautiful bridge. So obviously the creek reformed. The day of the battle, soldiers wrote up and down the lines. We're going to hear down at the fort. The creek was hip deep. Union soldiers in the second corps crossing up at the Fry Ford, hip to chest deep. Remember Civil War soldiers carrying his ammunition here, you can't get that wet. So, a, a lot of issues. Across a body of 5,000, 10,000 men, Union soldiers, they're gonna need a bridge. There really is no way around it. So, once again, the Confederate line up here, back to that, 200 yards to your left, and we're gonna walk the entire length of the line. And how the soldiers are pretty much stretched out for almost two miles if you follow the line of the creek. From here, it's about it's a mile or so as the crow flies to Snavely's Ford. But the way the creek bends, it is really stretched out. And in the end, we'll see how roughly 3,200 Union soldiers are delayed in trying to find fords and trying to snake their way along the Antietam Creek until they eventually are able to find a place that's sort of suitable for crossing. Was the snake was for. So, what we're going to do now, the best way, you folks, and to keep your feet a little bit drier, is just to sort of single file back the way we came, and I'll meet you on the other side of the, of the tree line here. Well, you have the rifle pits, supposed rifle pits, actually the quarry pits used to, to dig out the game rock to build a bridge. Only about 25 to 30 men in this spot. You can see how their line of fire from here now starts to open up. Look across, you see the high ground on the other side. Try and imagine trees a little bit thinner. There were tall trees here, but not this undergrowth that we that we have today. So this was a great spot, and everyone on the Confederate side realized that this was a great spot to line a defensive position. And so we start making our way down here. It's roughly right as we start going down the stairs a little bit. That's where the second Georgia became and connected with the 50th Georgia. 100 men in the 50th Georgia stretched out as, as long as we're gonna walk. Really an open formation of 100 guys. So we your quintessential skirmish line. Skirmish line really stretched out. These guys are really stretched out. <clears throat> they thought there was an old possible Forward crossing at the big, the smaller bend in the Antietam Creek just down here, a couple hundred yards, and so these men are defending that ford. It's not really a, a ford that the military is going to cross, but nonetheless, they still line the banks here overlooking the creek, They're protecting a, a small ford down here. And the line continued, the 50th Georgia continued almost all the way to the Snavely Ford. So, I mean, 100 guys are stretched out a long way, long way. <clears throat> You also had a, a company of South Carolina cavalrymen on the far end of the 50th Georgia. And then two brigades that we heard, they're not there when the fighting unfolds, but two brigades just tying yesterday into today. Manning's Brigade, 
They're the ones that attacked the ridge right just to the east of the Dunkard Church. They're the ones that hit George Green's flank. Uh, Ransom's Brigade. They're also on the far end west of Snavely's Ford when the day unfolds. But they're not there when, when the fighting and when the Ford is taken. Because they're obviously stripped to the north end of the field. But that's how far Manning's men went from this end of the field all the way up to the Dunkard Church. It's a pretty good distance. Pretty good distance. So questions yesterday evening, how could 3rd Arkansas and the 27th North Carolina, the ones that attacked and hit Green's flank, how could just a small move from the other side of Modern Route 65 to the church to the Mumah Cornfield, how could that tire out the regiment? Well, it was that fighting in addition to a, a walk of, a pretty quick walk of two miles to get to the point where they started. So, sort of the idea of tying everything together this morning as we're starting to talk, we're seeing some of the Confederate brigades down here. They're the ones that we talked about yesterday. They're shipped up to the north end of the field. So, we're going to move from here. We're going to make our way up towards, I'm not even going to stop at the Georgia Overlook. Nothing to see from up there. It's just too filled with trees. We can't even see the creek down there. So, we're just going to bypass that, make our way, once again, walking the skirmish line, if you will, the 50th Georgia. Up on the high ground is where they would have been would have been posted. And our next stop, make a brief stop over here. You can see the artillery position. Uh, the two guns, or I should say the two batteries back there, Richardson, Eshelman, since they weren't really of any use, Toombs believed, back where they were, another battery was posted just on the green ridge here to the, the south and, and west of us a little bit. And from up there, they have a clear shot all the way down this avenue towards the bridge towards the bridge confederate artillery out on the still a little bit hard to see but the highest trees out here to your left to the north of us those high trees a little bit back into the left that's on a line with the national cemetery some confederate guns up there and they're able to fire towards the high ground and the area where the ninth corps is is forming up and it's actually some of the guns out there firing towards isaac rodman's division those are the federal soldiers I'll be talking about this morning that crossed the Snavely's Ford. So roughly at 9.30 in the morning, Rodman's division, 3,200 men, they're almost directly across from us when the day unfolds. With the artillery out there starting to boom, they get hit pretty heavily. And they're forced to move, and they move a little bit south. They were posted over there because the night before, they were put in their bivouac area, supposedly right near the Ford where they were going to cross. You're going to see that's not really the case. Not really the case. So Confederate artillery just over here and on the cemetery firing towards the other side and the back side of the hill in front of us. Yes, sir. Why didn't the Confederacy just destroy the bridge? Why didn't they blow up the bridge? Great question. I don't know that we have the answer to it. A couple different answers, a couple reasons maybe. They know that that's going to be a choke point. Number one, obviously they're setting up here, so they know the Federals are going to come that way. So they're forcing them there. Might do a little more damage than blowing up the bridge or destroying the bridge. I guess the second question is, how are they going to destroy the bridge? That's a style, That's a hell of a bridge. Mm. That's been here since 1836. And we have photos with the water right up to that middle arch, right up to the bottom of that middle arch. Maybe Those monuments are covered over. Unbelievable. So water comes through here all the time. That's a strong bridge. So difficult to do. How are they going to do it? I always throw out the Wiley Coyote method, you know, <laughs> kegs of black powder, running a string of black powder up here in London. I, but they, they don't have the means to do it. And if they were to do that, if they destroy that bridge, does it make it easier? Does it dam up the creek a little further down and make it a lot easier to cross? Hmm. Not that there's any place to go. I mean, this, they're not going to ford here. There is no way to ford the Antietam Creek right here because of the way this land rises right up out of the, out of the creek. There's nowhere to go. Forces, There's nowhere to go. It forces a large number of Union soldiers to, yep. it bogs them down just because they have to focus on it. Exactly. So it disables and, and, and keeps your opponent in sight the whole time. And, and, and freedom the, to move around. The issue being, there's a large body of Union soldiers over there, and this is the place to cross, but there's not a large place over on the other side to mass 12,000 guys. So they're sort of... And you can control it. With they're forced in there just because of the terrain. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. terrain really forces a lot of the decisions and the reasons why why things unfold here. Yeah, yeah. So, 
I'd also add that Lee might want to use that bridge for a decisive counterattack. Exactly. Leave your options mm -hmm. open. And Lee was in Maryland to make friends and get support for the Confederacy. You don't get support, you got to win the hearts and minds of Maryland, not by blowing up people's bridges. Just a couple thoughts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's, there's no. There, no it's right all. Answer. It's all thoughts. There's, there, there's no right answer. We don't. We don't know. They never said why. They just. They're setting up here, and there was never any in any of the discussions of why they set up here and all that stuff of blowing up the bridge. Mm -hmm. I get that question every time I'm down. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. Plus it's National Park Service property. <laughs> 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 got a point. Okay. We're going to make our way towards the south. <laughs> Over the Antietam Creek, I know some of the hikes of the past we started at the, the Rohrbach Campground. So if you were to pass the campground, eventually you'd make your way down a hill, you'd be able to see in the wintertime the 11th Connecticut Monument and you eventually get to a bend or a place in the road where the Antietam Creek is very close to it. And that actually is just up here, just through these trees, maybe 100 yards, a little parking area, towns people fish over there and so on. So that was the ford that Confederates were pretty sure the Union soldiers weren't going to use to try and get across. I mean, you can, you can see why. You can see this high ground over here. So where, where in anywhere down here is there a place where thousands of men can get down to the banks of the Antietam and then once they were if they were to get there and how were they were going to be getting across there's no place for them down here to form up or for you to to mass soldiers once they were able to get across and so no matter what the situation is can you imagine 5,000 10,000 having a single file down that hill to get to this place to get over here and then once and they have to single file back up it's, it's taken us just a little while to get down here with 30 people so, at any rate, the 50th Georgia is still up on this ground, a little bit behind us. They're using the high ground here behind. You'll notice that to our right as we walk down here, there's a little bit of open area before it sharply rises up. And as we walk down here now, this is, we'll be walking for a pretty good stretch. But Rodman's men start over there with the artillery firing. They move a little bit south. About 10.30, they're put into motion. So again, about 3,200 men make their way to the fort. Very quickly, Isaac Rodman figures out the fort he was told to use is not going to be forward. It's not going to be fordable. It's not a good fort. So they just keep walking on down. And in the end, a, a short, supposedly was going to be a short walk, turns out to be about a two-mile walk to get to the fort. We're not going to be walking all two miles to the fort. It's not quite two miles from here. But from where he started, out in this direction, for him, it's going to be roughly two miles because of the way the creek winds and bends and so on. We made pretty much a straight line here. He's following the Antietam Creek, which is quite bendy. So, obviously not a good ford right here. Not a place to cross 12,000 men or 3,000 men or 300 men, really. So, if we walk along here, just notice up to the right, once again, this is still 50th Georgia, all the way down along this high ground. As I said, just really stretched out. Waiting for, waiting to make a report back to say, you know, Union soldiers are, are trying to ford someplace in this area, which you'll see there isn't a good place to ford until we get down to a big bend in the Antietam Creek. And um, even then, that was supposed to be the ford. That was supposed to be the ford. So in the end, it turns out, Robin's men aren't posted in the right spot the night before the battle. And he has a pretty tall task ahead of him when he wakes up the next morning. So. We'll make our way towards the west. High <clears throat> yeah, okay. cliffs on the battlefield. We walked that terrain yesterday. They probably would have wouldn't have believed you. But you get down along here, it's it's really difficult terrain. <clears throat> this certainly has a couple good things going for it. As far as fording, you have a, a pretty low area over there. It looks pretty easy. A shallow entry point. Not too bad to get out right here. But the problem is all of these hills behind. Where is a body of 100 men going to go? I mean, we're, we're jammed up right here. There's no place to go once you get across. And so, something like this, you could say, yeah, Union soldiers could cross here. The creek isn't too deep. It's not hip deep here, certainly. It's a shallow cross, or I should say a short crossing. There's a lot of open area on the other side. And you have to remember, there, these trees weren't here. This was pretty open over there. And this high ground was also... <coughs> pretty open as well to this side of us so 
Couple good things for a Ford here. Shallow entry point. Creek's pretty shallow. Exit pretty easy, but this is the problem behind all this high ground. All this high ground behind you. So alright. We make this maneuver down here. Rodman, nobody has one of these. <laughs> okay, just keep that in mind. Nobody has one of these as we try to make this maneuver. Very good. No problem. <laughs> okay. The noise you hear behind me, that is the Ford that Rodman was supposed to cross. That's the Ford the engineers found that said that's where you're going to cross. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but it doesn't really look like a good place, does it? <laughs> if you look up to this high ground up there, that's incredible. So once again, how are you going to get men from up there down and across. Now there certainly is behind you a lot of open area where you could form up 3,200 men. But getting to the creek and getting across, that's a, another story. Yeah. So that being said, Isaac Robbins Division said 3,200 men, two brigades. We'll talk about them later today as well. But Harrison Fairchild, we had the 11th Connecticut, 8th Connecticut, 16th Connecticut, 4th Rhode Island. Now the 11th Connecticut, they're left back at the bridge. We'll hear about them in just a little bit. They make initial attempt to push towards the bridge. So they're back there. The other division, Fairchild's, or I should say the other brigade, Fairchild's Brigade, you have the 9th New York, 89th New York, 103rd New York, and a battery of boat howitzers. Boat howitzers. What are boat howitzers? Howitzers on boats. Howitzers on boats. <laughs> and so how do you think they put those boats anywhere near here? Probably nowhere. They didn't have the boats here. Exactly. They didn't have the boats. Boat howitzers. Five brass cannon. Two were rifled. Three smoothbore. They were pulled around the fields of Virginia and Maryland and wherever else by two horses. Each cannon, two horses, and two men with ropes attached to the trail to help when they're going downhill, maybe steer a little bit. No limber or caisson, but an army supply wagon that carried all the other stuff, ammunition, implements, and so on. The army wagon also carried rifles for the artillerists who would later become infantrymen when needed. And so, the boat howitzers, they're also with Fairchild's Brigade. <clears throat> the other brigade was a group of soldiers from Ohio. Ewing's Brigade, the 12th Ohio, the, who else is with them? The 36th, 12th and 36th, and I have to get off the top of my head, I'll have to look and see. 23rd and 30th, 12th and 23rd and 30th, Ewing's Brigade, that's right. Sometimes the numbers just get all jumbled up here, believe it or not. 12th, 23rd and 30th, we'll hear about them way later in the day. But <clears throat> Ewing's Brigade, they're put up on this high ground. And the battery is unlimbered up there. And they start firing and peppering the woods behind you. And they're also firing down the flank of the 50th Georgia. They're hitting those men, and they're also hitting guys defending the bridge. If you go back and you can look through the official reports, and they, Confederate defenders talk about cannon fire coming from their right, insulating their line. So, very quickly though, it's realized that even though they've unlimbered up there and some of the men from the 12th Ohio pushed across as skirmishers, this isn't going to be a place to cross 3,000 men. And so two companies from the 8th Connecticut, <clears throat> Corporal Upham is their commander, they're sent by Rodman further downstream to try and find a ford. So from here, Snavely's Ford is going to end up being, we have about 700 yards to walk until we reach Snavely's Ford. So this was the Ford that Rodman was told about that he was going to use to cross, which is way further from where he was put into bivouac the night before the battle. So once again, he wakes up, artillery fire, so he moves a little bit. They settle back down. Then 1030, they're told, get moving again. They move to the Ford, eventually find this Ford, which obviously isn't usable. So. Those two companies from Connecticut are sent further downstream to find the Ford. So you can see this starting and stopping isn't really doing a, a lot of good for this division 
that was supposed to come up and try to get behind the Confederate defenders guarding the bridge. So, so Brian, what time are we in the day? Well, the Rahman starts moving from his spot at about 1030. And the guys don't cross the four. They won't get down here, and this action doesn't start until about the same point the third Union assault to carry the bridge is successful. Successful. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of talking, a lot of numbers. <laughs> so about the same point that the third unit attempt to carry the bridge is, is, is being made, these guys are crossing the ford. So roughly 12 o'clock-ish. And once again, it's very hard to put a time on something, but yeah, just, yeah, ball, ball. No. three hours it took them to get from the bridge to the ford. And we're taking, once again, we're taking a shortcut. We're pretty much using the interior lines we talked about earlier where those guys are exterior lines following the Ford. How big so, are those both houses? I have no idea. I didn't read about it. I, didn't, I couldn't <laughs> find a picture. I mean, I found, you know, Google search boat houses or anything. But then, are I mean, they like the ones they took up Maryland Heights? I don't, have, I don't even know if they have wheels, to be honest with you. I have no idea. I don't know if someone knows. I, I don't know. I'm thinking if they're... I don't know if they're on a big skid and they're just pulling them along because what happens is, jumping ahead in the story, they do cross the, the fort over there, but the, the commander, Whitting, he seems the, the terrain is too rough to take the boat housers up where they're going to move over there. So once they cross, they're sent back down this same trail. They recross at this ford and make it all the way back to the bridge. And then they run into Burnside, and Burnside says, you're not going to need those cannons. Get your rifles and sends them across. <laughs> oh, man. So that was their day, exactly. Oh man, <laughs> probably wasn't their response or something along that line. Was, so I, I don't really research project. Research project. Anyone on boat howitzers? They got wheels. Don't know. They got. They got. They got. Well, yeah, because they're attached to the trail, so they have to be something, something there. But anyway, right. so we have about 700 yards to the ford, and this route is the route those guys came back. To, to cross over the ford and get get back across. So not a good, probably not a good morning for those guys. Not a good morning. Probably tough. Hi, yeah. but this is where the guys from the 8th Connecticut determined it would be a good place to ford the Antietam. This is Snavely's Ford. Said looking up on the other side there, it looks, looks a little high, certainly shorter than in other places we saw. The land quickly starts to slope off. And so the boat howitzers were pulled from that high ridge to just a little bit further here to the west. This is about where the Confederate defense ended. A company of South Carolina cavalrymen, they're up on this high ground, connected with the 50th Georgia. And from, from here about well, pretty much where that tree line is. A couple hundred yards up along that tree line is a rock wall which Confederates were posted behind. And the Snavely buildings, you could see the barn down here a little ways. And once again, the 50th would have continued along that line. Off you, as we were making our way just last couple hundred yards or so, if you looked up to the right, where those metal posts started on our left, if you looked up to the right, as we were walking along there, it reminded me quite a bit of, of a little round top area up on Gettysburg. Pretty good incline with rocks here and there. Pretty rough and rugged terrain. But as the federal forces get down here, now we started at about nine o'clock and it took us about an hour to get down here, a little less than an hour. We stopped a couple times and whatnot, but we're moving 30 people. Rodman finally gets to the Ford. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was, it was. Rodman gets to the Ford. Once again, he's crossing the same time the bridge is carried, so 12, 12, 30, so in the end he made Pretty good time, I would say. Moving 3,000 guys two miles from where he started is a pretty good, pretty good time. But we get down here, the first group to cross, Fairchild's men, the 9th New York, and as they're crossing, they start to take fire from these Confederates up here. Not enough that it causes them to stop and start loading their weapons. They just push on through. They do take some casualties. But as soon as they cross, they move over here to the right, and they use this wooded slope sort of as cover. As they stretch out along there, then they just push right up that hillside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right up that hillside, breaking around the rocks where need be, but they go up that hillside. And right behind them, 103rd New York and the 89th, they follow as well. Next guy's to cross the 4th Rhode Island, part of Harlan's men, so they'll cross 
and they form up here in this field, which was a pasture field and a plowed field. So they'll form up, take on those guys. The 16th Connecticut, they cross, and then they do, they extend the 4th Rhode Island line. And they're even on the other side of these barn buildings here. Skirmish lines are sent out and sent up that way and sent to the left as well. So the 16th Connecticut, first shot, some of those guys are firing are not out in the lower cornfield, which we'll hear about later, but they're involved in some skirmish firing down here. That's where they're getting their feet wet, if you will. The Confederates quickly fall back. <coughs> it's just sort of more of a delaying action than anything. They're not supposed to, as, as they are at the bridge, not hold it till the last man. Just stay down there as long as they can hold out. Well, 3,000 guys start coming across. 200 guys are going to fall back, not even 200, they're going to fall back pretty quick. And so, Harlan's men, the guys from Connecticut, the 4th Rhode Island, they'll push up. As we walk up along here now, we're making our way back towards the bridge and what we call more the, the lower end of the battlefield, the auto farm and so, and, and so on. <clears throat> so as we walk up this trail, you'll see there's a little stream that'll run off to the left. Harlan's men are pretty much moving right up that trail that we're going to use. Right up the stream is what they're following and they eventually will post themselves in the far end of the Union line. Fairchild's men, as they start pushing up in that direction, they'll connect in with the 48th Pennsylvania. Cross the bridge earlier, and they're fanning out towards the south. As soon as they cross the bridge, they start pushing south. Fairchild's men will connect up with the 48th, and then both Fairchild, who's still in contact with Harlan over here, they'll pull into a position in the ridge just east, or I should say just behind the ridge, where Clark and Durrell's batteries were placed, which is just east of the auto farm line. So, that was sort of Rodman's expedition, if you will, moving from, he started the day on the Rohrbach farm, right near the lower bridge, all the way down over here, all the way down over here, oh, and finishing up, so once they cross, finally you and these guys, the last ones to cross, once again they cross, Whitting, the battery commander of the howitzers, he gets over here. This terrain's too rough for my gun, so they're back down the trail, across the ford, and back all the way to the bridge. On that side, on the eastern side of the Antietam Creek. So, anything you want to add here? Uh, just two things. Mm -hmm. uh, this is private property. Mm -hmm. The park does not own this ford site. When you came off that little trail there, that, that's the property line. Just the guy keeps it up pretty good for us. He though. does, he does. He's <laughs> built a little bridge. He, he knows people yeah. come down here, so yeah. we... Just so you know, it's mm -hmm. private property, yep. and I would estimate from here to the North Woods, it's four miles, because it's three sure. to the bridge, and we're, as a crow flies, a mile. Yep. So it's four miles, so if you want to think of the length of the battle, if you will, four miles. From here to the North Woods. Up on these high ground, that's where Manning and Ransom's guys were when the day started, and they're sent up to the Dunker Church. Yep. Right. So it's Which is a good push, three, three miles. miles. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the reason that Brian and I, we do these hikes, is to give you the scale and the scope of it's not a quarter inch on a map. <laughs> it's way, it's a lot larger, and this is the only way you can do it. So it's worth it to make this loop down here, I think, just to give you Absolutely. a sense of the scale and the scope. How many and folks have walked that part of the Snavely Ford Trail before? How many folks have done that? A couple people. But <laughs> well, a couple. lot that haven't. Yeah, so. a lot that haven't, yeah. so. That's all, all right. You want to lead back up to where you okay, want to go? Okay, sure. Brian, earlier, the artillery position for the Confederates early on is right there. You can see just as clear as can be. Right there on that bump, which you can shoot right down the valley. And the other thing that's really important here to remember is everything you've done so far, everything I'm going to talk about down at the bridge, is all prelude. Your objective is not the bridge. Your objective is the right flank of the Confederate Army. That's your objective. The bridge is just a means to get you there. The ford was just to get you there. All this was just to position you to make the attack. That's your objective up there. That, that house is up on the Harpers Ferry Road. That's where you got to go. You know, we believe me, we've heard every comment, every criticism, particularly of Burnside and McClellan. I'm going to give a little of that, but once they took the bridge, you got to go up 200 feet. Okay? All of this marching, all of this fighting, then you've got to attack a 20 story building. And that's what we're going to do this afternoon, so <laughs> this was the easy part, I guess, in some respects. But where the town is? Uh, that way. But the right of the Confederate line extends almost to that house. Well, more than that direction. Uh, the other thing here is this is this ridge line right here in front of us, this little bump. You can see how it kind of continues through that little gap. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Okay. And then it continues up to the north. After the bridge, I'm getting ahead of the story here, but after the bridge is taken, after they cross at the ford, it's behind that little rise is where the entire Ninth Corps forms up for the big final attack. So somewhere right up in here is where they connect, then I would sure. think. Yeah, Harlan, Har Harlan would be all right down in here, and then Fairchild's right up all in there. Yeah, so this right out here in front of you is the connection point from the guys that crossed what we just did to all the soldiers that crossed at the bridge. Oh, right. So they're going to come from those two directions, connecting this rise, and, and they're going to connect up in here because they're protected from the fire out in front. You know, they're going to they're gonna stay low behind this between one and three. So between one and three, everybody's forming up in this, on the back side of this little hill here. So, this was, everything we've done is just prelude, and everything that happens at the bridge that we're going to spend the next hour talking about is all just prelude before the real action starts out here. Uh, just as an introduction to this afternoon, uh, there's five times as many casualties out here than there was over here or over here. I mean, actually, everybody out, that's one of the problems in this park, is everybody that visits, they go to the bridge, it's 95 degrees, the kids are screaming, and they <laughs> shut down, that's it, we're done with our visit, and they don't understand that that's just the beginning, all of the actions out here. And so we've been really fortunate over the few, last few years, well we bought the auto farm, 03 maybe? Yeah, was seven, eight. Seven, eight maybe? I don't know, somewhere in there. Uh, this, all this ground was private until just very recent. And uh, so we've done a lot of work to try to clean this up and open it up and get out of here. So that's the action. The bridge is just prelude. So, But we've got to go through that, talk about how that happened. So. I saw inside the visitor center, they said they used to drive cars across the bridge apparently at one point, like till 64 or something? Till 1964, yes sir. So was there like a road over here? Yep, or? road came right up. The parking lot to visit the bridge used to be right there. Huh. And I talked to locals that grew up here, they said back in the 60s they'd come down here and have picnics, car washes, you know, it was a big... <laughs> and there was a asphalt across, just like the road did at the time, and asphalt with... Uh, Guardrail. Guard thank you. Guardrail over there. I mean, just looked completely different. So, uh, yeah. Then they built the bypass. I can't quite see it up there in the trees, but they built the bypass uh, to get the cars off of it, thank goodness. Some of the first land that was bought in the park was down in here to try to protect this. Uh, when the battlefield was transferred from the War Department, the United States Army created this park in 1890. The National Park Service didn't exist. And we're in the middle of nowhere. So the War Department, for 40 years, when they created this park and managed it, they only bought 65 acres. And all that was was the road network. They built the roads that you still travel on today to get you to the fields that were going to be there forever. So there wasn't any land at all. In fact, the legislation and the transfer said we would never own more than 600 acres. And that was in effect until 1988. When a little, you know how they do those uh, add-ons? to the bills, and they got it so we could go to our boundary, which is 3,000 or so. Uh, now we have about 2,700. And then the rest, uh, the other three or four is in scenic easement. So the Wilson family and uh, up here, it is protected, but not in full ownership. All right, I have another question for you. Point two, the historic cornfield. <laughs> oh, everybody jumped all over that, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, somebody. It's that way. <laughs> yeah, that's that way. <laughs> I mean, the point here is, you know, a lot of criticism about all this disjointed attacks and, and uh, you know, piecemeal and all that. But that might as well be in another county, <laughs> maybe another state. So we're really talking about almost two completely separate battles. And actually, in my opinion, the plan was brilliant because you're going to keep hitting on the northern flank until Lee strips this flank, and that is exactly what happens. But what they did not anticipate, which we're going to see even wor worse this afternoon, was all of this terrain, this fortress here that they had to attack. So uh, They did not anticipate that. But the plan of hitting the right, hit the Confederate left, Union right, hit it, hit it, hit it, strip this flank, and then launch here was exactly the way to do it. It just, the execution got a lot harder than what anybody anticipated. And I think, hopefully, for the folks that were here all day yesterday and the folks here this morning understand now why the execution is so hard. What's at the, what's at the Rohrbach Farm now? Is that 
That is privately owned. Privately owned. It's pretty much pristine to the day of the battles. Got okay. one of the nicest barns I've ever seen. Actually has HR in the bricks, Henry Rohrbach. It's beautiful. It's privately owned. The guy that owns it is actually a park ranger at uh, Harper's Ferry. So it's over the crest of it's this hill? It's over the back side of that hill, exactly. Is that right? Now, uh, Jeff Bowers. A uh, couple things here. I already had one question. You know, you got to talk about it when you come down here. Is That is uh, one of our park witness trees. It was here the day of the battle. I have a photograph I'll pass around. I'm sure most of you have seen this, but it's a photograph from the time. Uh, you can see the sycamore right here in the photograph. It's about that big around the day of the battle. And also notice how the tree side, the tree, you know, over there looks basically exactly the same as it does today. So even though we had that development and cars and all that, it's back pretty close to what it was. So uh, the one thing that is different, though, is the view from the other side looking this way. I'll pass this one around, too. And what I want you to pay attention to is uh, right in here, which would be right there, there's just there's really no tree right there. We're all that kind of cedar kind of stuff. That's much more open. So all of those attacks down on this end that we're going to walk to and talk about, that is much more open than what it is today. And this tree line was a little farther back. I mean, it's a steep hillside, and that's why the trees are there. You can't farm it, but this was all cleared over on this end. <coughs> uh, the witness tree was in big trouble uh, because of actual over-visitation. Uh, that is a sacred part of this park. Uh, the stone wall, the day of the battle, you can see in the photograph, did go all the way to the bridge, but that piece was taken out for the flooding, the pressures from flooding. But so many people were visiting the tree that just a couple months ago, not even that, we put this fence rail in, and we have to protect it. So that just went in. I know it's nice, but you can stand here and get a great picture. The bank was getting eroded. The worst thing for a tree is all that compaction. Uh, you know, that kills the roots, and we don't want to lose it. I will tell you the worst damage that ever happened to that bridge, even more than the battle, ten years ago, one of those gigantic branches fell off and smashed into the bridge, busted about an eight-foot hole. Uh, that tree, sycamores can live four or five hundred years. So, uh, we want to protect it. Uh, actually, uh, pretty soon, we're going to put a new, one of these waysides right here, kind of a little mini wayside with that photograph, and to tell people that this is a we want to protect the witness tree. So that's going to go in uh, probably by next spring. So the road did come up from, the reason this bridge was built for $2,500, pretty good investment, uh, was to connect the next town south, Roarsville, with Sharpsburg. There was a whole series of these bridges all built by the same company in the 1830s. To just, it's a county improvement project. And Roarsville's to the south, crossing over, and then up into Sharpsburg. So Sharpsburg's in that direction. Uh, the, the locals would call it the Rohrbach Bridge for the Henry Rohrbach Farm or the Roarsville Bridge. Uh, the military called it the Lower Bridge. Now, that term wasn't used before the battle took place. So the upper, middle, and lower bridge. Uh, Burnside, we've seen that whole flanking movement. 3,200 men that uh, went south with Rodman. Uh, three brigades, basically. Robin had the best middle name in the army. Peace. P E A C E. Now, for years, I told the story a hundred times. Uh, it was thought that he was a Quaker. Uh, the latest research, though, is that he was not a member of the Quaker Church. I mean, it just made the story was too good. That's why I told it. It turns out sometimes we're not right. And, you know, the, you gotta, the research never stops. So, turns out he was not a member of the Quaker Church. We actually. Somebody that lived up in the Connecticut. He's, he's a wealthy merchant from Rhode Island. He's got three kids at home. Not a professional soldier. He's a professor, right? That's yeah. And so we actually had the church record. Somebody did the research, found the church record, sent him to the park. And we learn all the time. Most of the things that we have shared with you is because about once a week, particularly in the summer, somebody walks in and says, uh, hey, my great-grandpappy was in the 7th of Virginia. And our first response is, do you have any letters, diaries, or photographs? <laughs> And uh, it happens once a week, and folks are, it's incredible. So we help visitors by saying, okay, they were here, here, and here, and just time and again, they'll give us copies of many of the things that we're sharing with you today. So. Awesome. Uh, the best analogy I've ever heard down here, I stole it from one of the other rangers I work with, is that, look at this place. It's a fortress. You're looking at the most difficult job on the battlefield. It is a castle. You're literally trying to attack a castle. 
The ramparts, yeah. there's the moat and the drawbridge. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there is no question that Burnside has the toughest job down here. Everybody knew it. All we've talked all morning here about the choke point. Now, there's Burnside. This is one of the great characters of the American Civil War. How this guy just kept keeping his career alive, I'll never understand. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of it was, it was one of those fellows that just everybody loved. Old Burn. I mean, he was just one of those great guys that just... Everybody loved him. But let me, let me share with you what all of the leaders that were responsible for taking this bridge, what they thought about this, the job they had before them. Now, on the march out from Washington, uh, they had a different organization. The Army was in wings. The Army was in wings. The right center and left wings of the Army, two corps. And the left wing of the Army was uh, the Ninth Corps and the First Corps. Where's the first corps in this battle? Yeah, Northwood Cornfield, as far away from here as you can get. Two days before the battle, when they're pulling in, they actually change the organization of the army, and that wing is separated as far as you can get from each other. So there's some uh, there's some issues there with you know what is going to be the communication flow, who's in charge. And we all know in our jobs, you know, it's really important to know who's in charge. It's very you know, Clear lines of communication and leadership is a very important thing in any organization. So there were some issues there. Burnside still saw himself as the wing commander. The actual tactical leader on the, this end of the field is Jacob Cox. Uh, Jacob Cox from Ohio. He's a great soldier. I have to like Jacob Cox because post-war he's the Secretary of Interior. Uh, <laughs> I gotta like him. He's my boss. <laughs> anyway, Jacob Cox wrote about uh, this position. I do not hesitate to affirm that the Confederate position was virtually impregnable to direct attack over the bridge. For the column of, here's the key point here. For the column approaching it was not only exposed at pistol range to the perfectly covered infantry of the enemy, it should succeed in reaching the bridge or charge across it. It must be made under a fire plowing through its length. So it's within pis pistol range and plowing through the length of any line that tries to get here. The head of the column melting away as it advanced. Every soldier knows it could show no front strong enough to make an impression on the enemy. In other words, you can't get enough guys down in this little valley to make a strong enough impression on the enemy. Uh, here's Sam Sturgis, one of the divisional commanders. The bridge was strongly defended by the enemy and the approaches to it exposed to a murderous fire. James Noggle. The position was strong one for the enemy, as he posted a strong force on the bank of the Antietam Creek, on the wooded banks of the stream, with precipitous banks that afforded them shelter from artillery and infantry. He approached through a narrow ravine, admitting not more than one regiment at a time. That's the story. Not more than one regiment at a time, upon which a deadly volley could be easily poured <coughs> by the enemy. Uh, Lyman Jackson, 6th New Hampshire, makes an attack down here. The opposite bank was a steep, high bluff, covered on its top and sides with forest trees. Behind these trees and behind the barricades of stones and logs, the rebels were strongly posted, their fire covering every inch of ground which our troops much marched to reach the bridge. And Edward Ferraro, whose brigade actually finally does take it. The bridge was naturally almost impregnable and very strongly fortified by the enemy. And even George McClellan said, Burnside was entrusted with the difficult task of carrying the bridge. Even he had to admit now, post-war, post-battle, uh, McClellan's going to use Burnside as a scapegoat for what happened here. And he's going to blame basically the whole thing on him. But I blame it all on this, on the terrain. So, so a lot of issues there on uh, what they have to do. And the reason that it's so tough here, the reason things develop and why we just did this walk, because the way you're going to try to do it is, here's the plan. The idea was send small attacks on the bridge to fix the Confederate position and then maneuver to outflank it. Fix and maneuver. Fix and maneuver. This is a standard military tactic that is still used today. So the idea was send small attacks on the bridge, hold the Confederates, keep their fire while Rodman goes downstream. Because remember, everybody thought it was only going to be a half mile down and they're going to outflank them. Every battle of war, every battle within a battle, it's about outflanking them. So that's why Rodman is sent downstream, fix, hold their attention, send Rodman down. 
Now the actual order, I got it here, the actual order was written at 9.10 a.m. At 9.10. This is McClellan's this order? This is McClellan's order. General McClellan desires you to open your attack. As soon as you shall have uncovered the bridge, you will be supported. There's a key line there. You will be supported, if necessary, on your own line of attack. So far, all is going well. At 9, 10 a.m., George McClellan says, it's all going well. And if you were with us yesterday, by 9 o'clock in the morning, there's 7,000 men killed and wounded up there. Oh, it's all going well. Uh, the first attack on the bridge is going to be led by the 11th Connecticut Infantry. Ken Colonel Henry Kingsbury is going to lead that assault. Supporting him, supposedly, was another brigade from Ohio, part of the Kanawha Division, Crook's men. Uh, the first assaults, what's the best way to get here? The best way to get here is to come down the road. That's the easiest way to maneuver. And those are all launched down here farther south where those initial attacks are launched. I'm going to walk down there and see where that happens. This is a great park, and uh, we have a, the greatest maintenance division that you could ever have in a national park. You see the park, how great this place looks. That being said. That being said. <laughs> however. However, for 10 years, they brought the trail over here, and this is the gate where every attack came through was right here. This fence was here, the gate was right here. For 10 years, the trail went that way That's and the right. guys, it was easier for them to mow over there. It's more important because it was easier for the mowers to get out than it wants me to have my gate. And for 10 years, literally, I fought that and they just did it. I'm very excited. This is where every attack came through, this very spot. This is the gate where they ate for the yeah. So we're standing in the old road? We are standing in the old road. It connects right there, exactly. That's what happened was the road came down and then it connected right there and continued south and then the bypass started. This is the third floor. No, that's uh, the Burnside, well, the Burnside Bridge Road, which doesn't take you to Burnside Bridge. Right. <laughs> People, visitors don't like that too much. <laughs> and the bypass really started there and goes up and around behind and out. So historically you came up just like that. So big success there. Very excited. All right, the 11th, 11th Connecticut is going to lead the assault. And Henry Kingsbury is going to lead that. Henry Kingsbury's brother-in-law is David R. Jones, a Confederate ca commander on the other side of the creek. They married sisters, Eva and Rebecca Taylor, Zachary Taylor's granddaughters. And this war tore the nation apart and it tore families apart. We heard yesterday, John Gibbon, three brothers in the Confederate Army. And so, brothers-in-law are facing each other here. And the idea was that they were going to act as skirmishers to lead the way down the road while Crook's Brigade was right behind them would be the primary force. And we're going to follow this trail up and you're going to see how this gets complicated. The terrain decides everything. Uh, Crook's men are going to get lost in the woods back here, basically, and end up 400 yards, well, 500 yards upstream from here. So the very first attack on the bridge does not go well. And the other thing you got to remember now, every step you take down this road, there are rifles there. We just walked that, and you saw all that high ground as we were coming down. There's a rifle up there every step. Now remember the 11th Ohio watched the advance, and he described what he saw down here. The fearful moment had arrived. The fearful moment had arrived. Skirmishers were advanced to clear the bridge and ledges of rebel sharpshooters. Forward rang out along the lines and the assaulting column charged the bridge. The opposite bluffs and ledges and ridge were instantly lighted up with one long sheet of flame. <coughs> volley after volley of musketry was driven into the faces of the advancing column. 
The head of the column pushed on bravely but was seen to waver and literally melt away before such a murderous blast. In vain the heroic champions of freedom struggled against the driving storm of iron and lead that tore remorselessly through their ranks. That's pretty good stuff right there. Did you hear the artillery? Oh no, could you hear it? Yeah, I just heard it. You just heard it, really? Oh man. There you go. Y'all, they heard the artillery up on the north end. I'm gonna read that. In vain, the heroic champions of freedom struggled against the driving storm of iron and lead that tore remorselessly through their ranks. In vain, they attempted to gain the bluffs from end to end were enveloped in one long line of flame and smoke. In vain, they threw themselves forward in a desperate energy, energy to seize the guns from those brazen throats <coughs> were belching forth destruction and death. Now, as they make this advance towards the bridge, Henry Kingsbury is shot going along the road here. They're kind of creeping all up along the fences. Kingsbury is shot. He literally falls against the fence. Two of his men rush to grab him. They pick him up, he's shot again. They take one step, shot again. One more step, shot again. He's dead within the hour. Killed by his brother-in-law's troops. Thanksgiving dinner wasn't so great that year. <laughs> Did the guys carry him to get hit? No, they made it. They got him out. Got him back to the Henry Warbach farm. Uh, his brother-in-law, David R. Jones, four months later, dies of heart disease at age 37. I would say a broken heart. <laughs> now, as they make his advance, their commander's been shot down. They get the great idea Let's wade the creek. So Captain Griswold and a company try to cross the creek right here. We've all just walked it. We've seen it. And so everybody that comes down here says, oh, they should have just waded across the creek. Griswold and almost every man in the company are shot down. Griswold's killed almost instantaneously. One of the men that saw that happen, he said, Griswold fell while in command of skirmishers in the first attack upon the bridge. He was the first to cross the stream and the first to fall. No tribute that I could pay is sufficient for the brave soul of Captain Griswold. He died as he lived, pure, patriotic, and brave. As they pulled him up out of the banks, his last words, tell my mother I died at the head of my company. All the rebels, all batteries were roaring. There was Confederate artillery support that Brian talked about up here. The air rang with whistling balls. The ground quaked with a hard breath of artillery. The 11th Connecticut descended to storm the Antietam Bridge. The rebel guns pouring a destructive fire of grape and canister while continuous volleys from an unseen enemy in the wood were showering upon them. Down the road leaped the 11th into this valley of death. Eleventh Connecticut is turned back. They will not be able to make it. Crook's men are going to continue north four or five hundred year, yards, not supporting this direct assault. So the first assault on the bridge does not make it across. And it's not even close. Maybe halfway. Maybe a couple. Maybe a hundred yards down the road. It just disintegrates. Yeah. So we're going to continue following Crook back north and talk about the other two attacks where we can get a better view of that. And we'll stop at the 11th Connecticut line. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did. 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 I did.